Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, welcome to the Smart Freight Leadership Series. Uh, this is uh, uh, our second in a series of freight related uh, seminars that's being put on by the Smart Freight Center. And today's presentation is gonna be by Professor Miguel Jaller, uh, who shops online and how sustainable is the delivery process? Uh, so I'm just going to say a few words before we pass the floor over to Miguel. Um, uh, first of all, my name is Matt Rorda. I am the chair of the Smart Freight Center uh, and professor at University of Toronto. Um, and this is uh, a seminar series where we really try to bring in the best and the, uh, the rising stars of freight transportation and logistics. And Miguel is definitely one of those folks. Um, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that this land on which the University of Toronto operates uh, for thousands of years has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. And today this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. A few housekeeping notes. Uh, we're going to be recording this session and uh, we're going to be, and thanks to uh, uh, Miguel's permission, we're going to be also sharing this seminar on the Smart Freight Center website after uh, it's completed. We'll also have a chance for questions and answers after the seminar, so uh, I think it makes sense to hold off your questions towards the end of the seminar. Um, so, Miguel Jaller, uh, very happy to introduce uh, uh, Miguel. Uh, with the presentation, Who Shops Online and How Sustainable is the Delivery Process. Uh, Miguel is a, an associate professor and co-director of the Sustainable Freight Research Center at the University of California at Davis. Uh, he received his bachelor's and master's of science in industrial engineering from Universidad del Norte, Colombia, and his ME in transport engineering MSc in Applied Mathematics and PhD in Transportation Engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. That's a lot of degrees. Um, his research is multidisciplinary, covers societal and private impacts of uh, freight transportation and logistics, works with uh, technology, developing tools for sustainable transportation, and uh, does work in modeling and freight transportation and logistics, disaster response, and many other things. Uh, and I've come to know Miguel over the years, a great friend of mine as well. So thanks, Miguel, for joining us today. Uh, and I'll pass the floor over to you. Thank you, Matt, for the presentation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, let me share right now. So thanks, thanks again for the opportunity to share with you uh, some of the work we have been doing in the area of uh, e-commerce, omni-channel distribution, and especially uh, freight distribution and, and last mile. So that's where I'm going to be focusing today on this talk. So first, I'm going to provide some background related to the shopping process. Uh, what exactly are we considering? Uh, what kind of fill some of the gaps in, in the knowledge and, and, and data mostly for, uh, for doing some of this modeling? Then uh, I'll show you some of the models we created to identify what are the factors that contribute to somebody shopping or what are the attributes of people that, that shop uh, either offline or online or through multiple channels. And then I'm going to show you some results of using these models and other models related to land, last mile deliveries to see how sustainable the process is from kind of an aggregate uh, point of view and then trying to uh, disclose a little bit so the shopping process, why are we here? Well, it comes from, from retailing and distribution. Every time you buy, every time you sell, there is an economic transaction and we send the money or we actually turn in the money and then that is translates into the actual movement of people, goods and services from one place to the next. So from everything that we are gonna be analyzing here is both the shopping process and also the transportation and travel process. And to actually say uh, if something is sustainable or not, we're gonna be comparing what is kind of the, the status quo, the base case with what we are seeing today and what can the, the future look like. So let me get into kind of the shopping process because I'm going to expand the definition a little bit 
uh, more. So what do we understand by, by the shopping process are all the activities that happen before the actual purchase, during the purchase itself, and then what happens afterwards. So what happens before, it could be when you search for products, when you compare products, when you actually come up with an idea that you need, or you get bombarded with advertisement, and then that induced demand is generated. Then during the purchase process is basically when you actually purchase it, when you select how you're gonna collect the product, or you are physically at the store, and you cut it, or you get some sort of delivery at your home, work location, or any other location. And then kind of the post uh, sale or the post purchase uh, comes in terms of the warranties, customer service, and returns. And what we have seen with the proliferation of uh, distribution channels, so what is a distribution channel? It's a way for you to actually collect the product or to purchase the product or to search the product. So you can search in a store, you can search online, buy in a store, buy online, and so on. So when we're talking about or understanding the shopping process and the associated shopping and travel behaviors, we basically can encompass those behaviors into four buckets. The first one is the substitution bucket, and it's when things that you were doing before in one way, now you, you substituted them in this other way. You were buying at the store, now you buy online. Complementarity. Complementarity comes in the form of, let's say you are buying a store and some products you buy online, or by buying in one channel or purchasing in one channel or searching one channel, you also generate a behavior in another channel, either physical or through uh, kind of tele, telecommuting, teleworking, and so on. We have modification. That's where kind of your process or shopping, collecting gets completely modified. And then you get the induced effect, uh, where by buying in one channel, you are induced to buy more or to travel more and so on. So all these behaviors happen. And as an individual, we may have, uh, we may be in all of those buckets. And that makes this really complicated. Uh, for instance, you may be able to substitute your, let's say now you don't buy computers in person, you know what a computer looks like, you are tech savvy, so you have completely substituted anything related to buying computers. Now you do it online, you get the delivery. Uh, in other cases, you may still be modifying. Now I order groceries that most of the groceries, I, I get it delivered, but I still like to go and get my fruit. So that could be either a modification of the entire process or a complementarity effect. So what do we know about all these different combinations? So UPS have done some of these analysis based on, on their data and there are also data aggregators out there that have analyzed more or less how people uh, behave. And what we have here on the left is kind of some of these combinations and they only kind of target a process before the purchase and the purchasing process. It doesn't contain anything related to the post uh, purchase or even the delivery channel. So what do we see here? We see that people that search online and buy online or that search in a store and buy in a store are basically doing just one channel. They either are doing everything online or do everything in a store. And that's basically about 60%. So we have single channel individuals. And then we have another 40% or say something percent that, are, that do combinations. And do, that, those combinations could be that you search in a store, then buy online, search online and in a store, and then decided to buy online, or the opposite, you search in both channels and then you buy in a store, or you say you search online, you don't need to travel to different places, you just browse the website, and then you buy in a store. Also, when we're talking about the purchasing, now basically you're purchasing from anywhere in the world. You're purchasing from anywhere in the world at any time of the day. We are not now constrained on the hours of operations of establishments. We are not constrained on the stocks that uh, some of the shops have near your house or the regional shopping mall and so on. We are shopping anywhere and that uh, carries on a lot of decisions from the supply chain, a lot of decisions from the transport point of view. But let's look about some of these combination of channels and then how they could translate into uh, changes in your travel behaviors. So let's say we get two, two extreme cases. The one in which uh, you used to buy in a store, 
and you collected the items in the store, and then you move to buying online and getting that delivered to your uh, desired location. It could be the residence, the work location, and so on. And let's see what happens to travel. So if we go back to the four behaviors, substitution, complementarity, modified behavior, or induced demands, let's see what happens to kind of the, the travel. And we're gonna bucket now and simplify it and say that there are two types of travel. The travel that you can do in your, as, a, as an individual, using your personal vehicle or using any other type of mode, and then the travel that happens from the commercial side. That will be the company dropping or delivering the cargo to you. So for substitution, you're substituting your uh, in-store purchases with online. Basically, that has a net effect. You're able to substitute, in the extreme case, your personal travel, and that gets replaced by a delivery vehicle coming to you. If you're doing complementarity, that could have the case in which your uh, personal travel remains the same. So you're still going to the store for some part of the purchase and then probably going more because you're buying now and you're getting uh, other behaviors. And then that also generates additional commercial travel because you are both buying a store and ordering online. Modification, it could just range, different cases could be here. And then in use demand, in most cases, we have both an increase in personal travel and in residential or commercial uh, deliveries. So as you can see, just with this simplified uh, case, you can see that actually answering what's better or not depends on multiple factors. And I'll give you more factors that affect uh, that sustainability of the shopping online versus the delivery process. What else affects uh, this? Well, we get basket sizes. It has been identified as one of the factors that kind of is different between buying in store versus buying online. What is the basket size? Basket size is how many products you should act, do you actually buy in one purchasing instance. And it has been shown with empirical data that people tend to buy uh, more products in one instance when you go to a store as opposed to when you uh, buy online. Grocery is a different segment, but in, in general, uh, we buy more products in one single purchasing uh, event when we are in physical than when we are online. And that has important implications because let's say you are you still need to buy 10 products, then you are generating more online purchases for those 10 products than how many times you went to a store to get them. Then we get into the delivery process, and that's the, the next dimension of how sustainable online commerce or online uh, shopping could be is what exactly are you using as the collection way? Are you ordering online and picking up in the store? Are you ordering online and now with COVID, curbside delivery have become kind of uh, common? Are you requesting products to be delivered to you uh, really fast? And I mean really fast. 10 years ago, it could have been four days. Then we went to two days. Now really fast can be one hour. And that, that has important implications to uh, the impact, the footprint of that delivery process. Also, we can have alternate locations. Uh, examples could be that you have a neighbor receive the product for you because you are not going to be home and you don't want, you want to avoid failed deliveries or you don't want the package to be lost and so on, or you're using um, lockers or any other alternative delivery location. And then we get returns. And returns is basically something that uh, e-commerce have had to deal with uh, since the beginning because that was kind of the main, one of the main challenges for e-commerce is that you are not able to test the product as opposed to going to a store, testing it, and especially in some product categories that that's actually uh, an important aspect of the shopping process. So in general, uh, e-commerce have generated additional returns. It could be the return rates could be actually uh, double those than in store purchases. And return rates for categories such as apparel and, and clothing could be up to 50%. So there are all, a lot of movements, a lot of processes and logistics that happen on these returns that can generate additional footprint and environmental impacts and congestion and noise and, and so on. And in addition to that, there could be problems with returns because there are products that we cannot resell. So there has something to, we need something to do with those products. In addition to that, when people need to make a return, there may be, you also have many channels to do it. You can go and return at a store, if, they, if the company has stores, 
you can go and drop them at a, a carrier location or a parcel company location. You can have that company to pick it up at, at your doorstep and so on. So better additional travel associated to this return. And all of these factors uh, affect how much energy, how much emissions are associated to every single uh, package that you buy or sell uh, uh, today. The truth is that we don't have enough information to do all of this. And private sector may know the data, but as, in, as academics, as planners, uh, other practitioners from the outside, it's really hard to get detailed information to assess all of those impacts. And I will say the literature have been uh, trying to fill in some of those gaps little by little. Uh, every paper will add a little bit of information. A little paper will try to cover one of the assumptions from previous research. But we are still kind of in, in, in the beginning of understanding the full impact of some of these factors um, in a quantitative way. So let me tell you some of the things that we know. Uh, so who shops online, who shops regularly, and how frequent. In the US, any given day, and this is basically uh, before COVID, about 40% of the population shopped, and two to 3% shopped online. Today, again, before COVID, in the US, about 55% of the population shops uh, online in a regular way. Uh, however, about 80% of almost anything that we shop uh, is affected by e-commerce. That means that we are searching online as opposed to going to different stores and testing the products, or that we actually compare or return to some of these um, channels. In 2019, uh, before COVID, in the US, retail sales were between 10% and 12% uh, of all uh, retail sales, uh, about $550 billion. So still important. We have seen a lot of impact from e-commerce e -commerce already, a lot of impact from e-commerce from the demand and supply side. And then also, uh, it, it's just a small percentage. And we have seen that increasing during COVID last year, and I'll talk about that a little bit. So let me tell you about some of the models that we have been doing. To do some modeling, we can use different type of data where we can collect some of different data sets. And this is an example of different things um, out there, at least in the, in the US, that have information related to e-commerce transactions or shopping uh, travel. We have from public travel surveys, so oh, there are other jurisdictions that have conducted specific surveys that have additional information. We have traffic data, we have market research data, and also now with crowdsourcing of information, we have different companies aggregating that type of uh, data. What I'm gonna be showing you is using some of the public travel surveys, such as the American Timing Survey and the National Household Travel Survey that are collected kind of regularly. So how can we use some of this data uh, to uh, identify or understand a little bit more on the shopping. The data, and I will touch on, touch on that um, next, uh, are different. The way they collect the data, the way that they assess, them, especially the, the online shopping. So it's important to know what are some of the limitations with some of these sources and what they actually tell you. So let's look at the, at the National Household Travel Survey first. So it's a travel survey collected regularly uh, the last one was in 2017, before that 2009, and, and 20, 2002, and so on. And we're gonna have one, uh, I think, next year. So it collects a lot of information, about 120 to 150,000 households, a lot of people, um, a lot of, about a million trips, and it contains many, many variables. However, uh, what we have here are the only variables that are related to online shopping in those uh, important surveys. Uh, in 2017, they asked how many times they purchased online for delivery in the last 30 days. In 2009, they kind of, they had a, something a little bit different where they asked two questions. One was the number of uh, internet purchases via internet in the past month and how many of those internet purchases uh, kind of derived into a delivery. So what we did, what I'm going to show you now, is that we estimated some models to understand what are the factors of people, what are the attributes of people, that uh, can tell you who's shopping online and then how frequent. And we compare what happened between 2009 and 2017. 
So this is basically a, a binary model. It tells you the, the, the likelihood that somebody shops online or not. So that's the only two choices. And we have a bunch of sociodemographic variables. And we have the two models in 2009 and 2017. And you have different variables related to gender, age, race, education, uh, income levels, how many people in the household, uh, the household location, uh, the generation or the, or the age of the individuals or the type of generation that is a proxy for the age, number of trips, uh, percent of the shopping trip from all those trips and some others. And what I'm going to do is just tell you a little bit of what are kind of the, some interesting findings. So the first one is in general, and, and they have been shown in many, many studies, is that uh, female in a, in a binary uh, gender, uh, female tend to buy more, um, not only more, but also they're more likely to buy online than the counterparts. Uh, mainly, you will see that whites uh, buy more than other races. Uh, richer, white richer people buy more. And if you see uh, the coefficients in the income levels, technically, uh, the, the poorer you are, the less likely you're gonna be buying online. So as expected. What it was interesting, let's say, between 2017 and 2009, is that in 2009, we found that somebody in an urban area had a higher likelihood to buy online than somebody from a rural area. However, we didn't find that to be statistically significant in 2017. So basically, we also see that in the, the last 10 years, um, e-commerce and the ability for companies to distribute uh, the products basically have no boundaries. Now, at least in the US, you can be in the middle of nowhere and you can still get products delivered to you. Also, we found that uh, the more people you have or the more children that are in the household, the more likely the household is that is to buy online. Uh, so something interesting as well is that we actually found consistency uh, between the, the characteristic of the people that were buying online in 2009 and the characteristics of the people that were buying online in 2017. The only difference will be is that in 2017, those people are even more likely to buy online than they were in 2009. But the characteristics haven't changed much. We, we see the same, the same trend, wider, richer uh, people um, buying online. Now the next mole is basically the frequency. And let me uh, make a clarification here that this is the frequency in a per month basis. And the previous model was also the likelihood that somebody buys online in a month. So it could be one time, it could be 50 times. We are just interested in the previous model of the likelihood that they buy online. In this case is how many times they buy in a month, but we have no ability to say if they buy all of those in one day or if they are spread uniformly throughout the month. Again, we see similar effects, uh, males buying less, than, than females, uh, the income levels affect how many times you buy. And now we can see that on average, a person buys six times per month in 2017, or the coefficient is telling you six times per month in 2017 compared to 1.8 times in 2007, uh, and then it's affected by different factors. But if we look at uh, income levels, we can see that from the highest uh, income level to the poorest, basically it reduces in about two uh, um, shopping or two uh, online shopping instances during that month. And then again, we see that uh, households with young children also buy more frequent during that uh, month. So what we can see at the aggregate, what are the characteristics of people that are buying, the likelihood that they buy, and how many times they buy in a month. Now, that's important, that's useful, but when we are trying to model, let's say what happens in a distribution in a, in a daily basis, we may be limited on what exactly we can get from this type of more aggregate models. That's why we went also with the another type of data set, and that is the American Time Use Survey. Uh, it basically have about 10,500 respondents. They almost do it every year, and it's a 24 hour uh, travel diary. Uh, it provides location or the type of location of each activity, uh, what are the type of audience, the type of destinations, the type of activities, how long they, they spend in one activity, 
the mode they use if they move from one location to another location. But it's, it doesn't give you kind of the, your reference. You don't know exactly what this is happening. You only have kind of an account of what a person did during the 24 hour period. So we kind of process that data and we use the different variables associated to activities related to shopping. And there were different categories, uh, shopping for groceries, shopping for fuel, shopping for uh, groceries at grocery stores or not at grocery stores, searching and comparing products. So we use some of those uh, those categories and then we use the location of those categories to identify which ones could be associated to online shopping and which ones were done actually in a store. So that happens during the day. So we can estimate uh, the likelihood now that somebody shops in a day, it doesn't, the person doesn't shop, or if they shop in a store online or to both channels. And we estimated other type of model that give you that those probabilities. So what we have here is the model, it's a multinomial logic model that tells you the likelihood that somebody doesn't shop, shops on, in a store online and both. And we see kind of similar trend. We see the likelihood of the females buying is higher, uh, higher than um, males uh, in this case. Uh, family structure, now we see that people with more uh, people in the household buy more, actually with both channels. Uh, we see that people tend to buy more online and also in a store during the fall. And we can expect that uh, because of the holidays. Uh, we also have the Black Friday, um, that is kind of a typical uh, day for, or, or period for online commerce. We also found that there are differences between people that live in really big cities versus smaller uh, cities. And then you see some of the interactions. Uh, female in larger cities by more than females in smaller cities. Uh, family with larger people in the household also have kind of this different behavior when they are in a, in a big city than, than not. Uh, we see education playing a role in how much people buy or the likelihood that they buy online. And we also found in the US that people in the West, uh, the West Coast also buy more than other locations throughout the so this model compared to the previous model is, is different in the sense that it tells you the likelihood that somebody buys in one day. So that's, that's a little bit more important because now we can say, what would be the demand for deliveries, let's say in a day, and, and you can have a lag, let's say all the shopping today is gonna be delivered tomorrow or two days from today and so on. But in general, we can assume that what happens in a day could be reflective of the demand for uh, deliveries. What have we seen related to COVID? So it's hard to not account for the changes in COVID. Uh, to tell you the truth, we, we don't know what's gonna happen in six months, how the system will be, but we have already seen changes throughout the last year. So this is a graph that tells you or, or compares for uh, a few countries, we have the UK, France, and the United States. We have the relative change from January uh, 2000 20, two different periods in 2020, uh, what was the relative change in online transactions, e-commerce transactions, that will be kind of the blue blue bar on the three countries. Then we have changes in the time spent at groceries and retail locations, that will be the uh, red and green kind of bars. And it's interesting to know that in the UK and also in France, some of these changes were kind of dramatic. I mean, they, they almost went to 100% uh, reduction in time spent at groceries in, uh, sorry, in retail in the UK and France, um, and mainly because they enforced more of a lockdown and, and all commerce was uh, closed. In the US, we see that the relative time change only drops to about 50%, the red numbers, and then uh, for groceries, it only basically drops to 25 let's say 30% in, in kind of the peak uh, of, the, of the pandemic, of the early pandemic. So it's a little different on uh, how the closures affected the time and how there was some sort of the, the, the level of substitution between retail and online and in retail. However, we also see that 
as time went by uh, during the pandemic and we went to basically the first wave uh, before the summer, uh, kind of the, the, the amount of time that people start to uh, spend in some of those locations started to increase when they actually open. And also we see a decrease in the, in the amount of, in the change of online transactions year over year, or from, sorry, from January to that uh, month. Now, overall, we see that e-commerce transactions have increased in the last 10, uh, 15, uh, almost double digits per year. And we see at the end of this graph, uh, we see what happened in the last three quarters in, in 2020. Actually, uh, the last quarter, uh, Q4 of 2020, will be released by census uh, next week, actually February 19th, so we don't know. Uh, so you see the, the huge increase in the e-retail sales that it went from, let's say, 10% to almost 50%, but it didn't drop. There's going to be a gain in some of these e-retailing, but we don't know by how much. Partnering with some colleagues in, at Berkeley, uh, they collected some data. It's actually panel data. They have data from 2018 from the uh, Sacramento region um, travel survey. And then they went in and, and collected information from some of those individuals in May. And these were kind of some of the findings from, from the work we're doing with them in here uh, for, with uh, Teddy. Uh, less frequent post-pandemic trips, most frequent post-pandemic trips or no change. So let's say we bucket those behaviors in those three uh, categories. We see that um, the frequency of shopping, and this for groceries, actually was associated with changes in the, in the basket size. In some cases, they were able to do less frequent uh, trips to the grocery store for X or Y reason, but they compensated some of those uh, that lower frequency with a larger basket size. So they were buying more every time they went to the stores. Uh, for the people that started to do more frequent, they also buy, bought more. And, and we were wondering why. And one of the reasons is that in some cases, uh, they may have been buying to, uh, for other members of the family or for neighbors. And then still, there were people that were no, did no changes between one, uh, between before the pandemic and now during the pandemic. Some of the main findings from, from this segment that give you kind of a more localized uh, aspect related to um, grocery in store shopping is that about 60% of the respondents uh, reported lower trips, about 60%. About 43% reported increased purchases or basket sizes, and about 51 respondents uh, indicated that they were purchasing for others, not only their household. Uh, most of the, uh, there were, more frequent e-commerce purchases and new e-commerce users, about 25% did not buy groceries before the pandemic and they were now doing online grocery shopping and about 27% were doing more frequent. What is also interesting is that in, in some cases, and 45% of the people responded that they were buying online, but are still going to the store and pick it up, core side or alternation. So we see that an increase in the e-commerce transactions may not be associated to a uh, reduction in trips. Because if you buy online and you are still going to pick that up, the map, they don't reduce your um, regular shopping. So let's say we know now that how many people who buy online and we want to know how sustainable it is. So at the higher, high level of aggregation, we conducted uh, last year with some colleagues, some high level analysis where we look at the entire supply chain of our, retail, our retailers and e-retailers. And we look into the contributions to energy and emission from data centers, the upstream freight, the packaging, warehousing, retail, store energy, last mile deliveries, computer networks, customer transport. So we kind of encompass many uh, categories of factors that can uh, generate some of these impacts. And what we can see here in this circle is that basically for the retail retailer and the e-retailer, the main difference between the two is that in the first one, we have a large contribution from the people traveling to stores. And from the e-retailer, we have most of the contribution from the last mile uh, portion of the, of the delivery of the supply chain. 
So we wanted to concentrate a little bit more on what are the effects of these two. This was high level, we wanted to do uh, more. We can also see, and let's say, let, if we look at the next two, two bars, we see what could be the impact on those energies when we see companies uh, delivering really fast or the customers asking the company to get them the products in the one day, next day, and so on. So we see that the impact can increase dramatically. So we went in and we actually did analysis on both the delivery side and also the customer uh, movement and customer travel and decisions. So we use additional data sets from, again, the NHDS, the uh, ATUS, and other data sets to develop a model to generate or to simulate the travel process related to shopping. So we analyze how people shop in a day, how they travel, how many times the shopping was done as a single trip, they went from home to store and back, how many times they actually did a tour where they stopped in several places along that tour, how many activities were performed at each of those stops. Because if we wanted to fully understand the impact of the substitution effect, let's say, we needed to fully attribute how much of the personal travel was related to that shopping activity and how much was not. Because we can go to the uh, shopping mall to buy, but also to go to the cinema before COVID, to go to buy at the restaurant just to move. So if we are substituting that shopping activity to online shopping, are we actually substituting the entire trip or not? So we went in and, and developed this simulator. We also collected data from different source, sources to analyze uh, the delivery process. How many, what's the distance of those vehicles? What are the missions? How many stops? What is the consolidation level? Uh, and we generated a simulator or, or a model to say, okay, under these conditions, what's better? People buying a store, buying online, following the regular patterns of those individuals through their uh, revealed behaviors. And we use that to generate or estimate the changes that could be um, experienced under specific circumstances. For instance, let's say we have an extreme case one that will be everybody buy, buying online versus everybody buying a store. So we, right now we don't have everybody buying online and, and we don't have anybody just buying a store. We have a mix, but this will give you kind of the, the two extremes. And what we can see here is that we see huge reductions in BMT, huge reductions in GAGs and some other pollutants. However, we actually uh, saw an increase in uh, some of the uh, criteria uh, or some of the uh, emission factors such as NOx, because basically we are replacing in many cases uh, a gas vehicle, a small passenger vehicle with a diesel truck. And that's where we see kind of the increase. Another scenario or another extreme case is people buying today through their regular in the regular likelihoods of buying in store online or both compared to the previous case of everybody buying in a store. Let's say this could be associated to what we get today. And again, we see the online channel generating some benefits. Uh, we still see not to be something to, to be careful about, but we don't see as much reductions as we saw in the previous case. And we need to, to understand that there are many assumptions under these results. So we don't account for the congestion effect. We don't account for uh, the increased number of trucks that need to go to the curbside and congest the cities or potential uh, conflict between the additional commercial vehicles and pedestrian cyclists and any other type of those externalities. So this is kind of a, a simplified aspect of the model to, to give you an order of magnitude of the, of the effect uh, of the changes between online and offline. So then we went in to analyze a little bit more those last mile strategies. So what else can, can be done? And we look into, okay, what happens if we deliver by bikes? What happens if we deliver by, uh, we use microhuff or collection points? What happens if we replace diesel trucks with electric trucks? Uh, what are the impacts of where the company is actually located or the warehouse is actually located? And what are the impacts of uh, time windows? So at the aggregate, what we see uh, in this slide is what are the impacts of where your facility is that is distributing the products to your uh, location? And this is more in, in Los Angeles uh, metro area. 
And we have here no time windows, so the, the company can distribute it within the day without having any time windows. Then we have the case of three hour time windows, 1.5 hours, and then one hour time windows. And we analyze total cost, externality cost, operational cost, and the grand total. Uh, what we see here is that it's important to acknowledge is that distributing in this really short time with those comes to a huge cost to the actual company. So it, it's not cheap for them to do so. You look, we look at the magnitude where it's the circle is on the minimum cost. And let's say they are able to optimize the location of the facility and so on. We see that we can go from 250 million, that doesn't matter what the number is, but we go from 250 up to 1000 in this case, uh, in the one hour time window. So the cost is actually really large. And if you also see the curve, that means that depending on where the facility is compared to the customers, the cost could kind of skyrocket and they, and then they go quite fast. And similarly, those emissions also go quite high, uh, if they are able to do this in an efficient way. So we get an increase of cost to the, the private operator, the company, but we also see an increase in cost to society to all these uh, different externalities. Then when we compare some of the, uh, and, and this is kind of the, the final, almost final slide, when we compare the different type of strategies based on time windows, and let's say we look at the cost per package or the emissions, emissions per package and how some of these last mile options compare we have door-to-door -door diesel, door-to-door -door electric, door-to-door -door using crowdsource services, but these are kind of a special uh, kind of crowdsource because they actually work directly for the company. Uh, using micro hubs or this smaller location where cargo then gets transferred to a smaller vehicle such as cargo bikes, uh, the use of collection points or door-to-door -door combined with micro hubs and collection points. We see kind of a, a difference between the cost and the missions. We see some of these strategies ranking pretty well on, in terms of cost, but they may not be the most environmentally friendly in terms of how many emissions, how, how much emissions they have. So we have kind of a multi type of objective problem here. Uh, we have the probably the private uh, trying to minimize cost, trying to use a strategy that allows them to offer the level of service that they are uh, offering. And then we have on their hand, what is the actual impact in terms of emissions and other externalities related to those uh, strategies? So this is where we are. We have uh, more results, uh, but I'm going to uh, stop here for now and then go to some of the discussion, final discussion. So empirical findings, shopping behavior, research. I've already identified the factors and the attributes of people that shop online or shopping store, how frequent they, they, they do. Uh, the research have also shown that if you want to account for the sustainability of the e-commerce, we need to pay attention to the last mile in both channels, uh, the in-store and the, and the uh, online. Even though there are emissions and energy use upstream of those uh, parts of the supply, uh, that's not where the money is in terms of allocating or, or researching the, the effects. Basket size, quite important. Rush deliveries can have an important uh, effect on the sustainability of these last mile deliveries. And then the impact of these rush deliveries can come at a huge cost to society and huge cost to the companies doing uh, or offering those deliveries. To be able to get the product that you want so fast, we need to have uh, more presence in the market. There, may, there are going to be land use implications to that. And we can also generate additional travel, additional miles, if the land use is not associated to how the system is uh, evolving. Crowdsourcing services can actually reduce cost to companies 30, 40%, but there now we get into more type of research such as how they, uh, are they formal parts of the freight system or not? Micro hubs, collection points can offer uh, some relief but they can come at an expense in terms of cost to the operator. So in general, uh, rush deliveries are not sustainable and these strategies only mitigate their partial impact. Then I'm gonna come into, if you have any questions, I'm open.
Great. Thank you very much, uh, Miguel. Uh, excellent presentation. Lots of food for thought here. Uh, we have about, about five or six minutes for questions. And questions can either be uh, entered into the chat box or you can just uh, turn on your microphone and ask the question directly. Well, maybe I'll start off then. Um, I'm interested to know uh, what kinds of strategies you see uh, some of the retailers um, engaging in to try to reduce the expectation for free, fast deliveries uh, with small time windows? That's a good question, Matt. And, and the truth is that there are some players that have the ability to do them by now, and there are others that do not. <laughs> and the problem is that the ones that do it, or that have the ability to do it, that's one of their competitive advantages. So they, frankly, they don't have an incentive right now to reduce the speed and then allow the other players to catch up. So, so we need to find a way of maybe from the behavior, from the consumer side of uh, the equation on sending a signal to the, those retailers to say, hey, I know you can send me that in one hour, but I, I don't want to. And I'm going to give you a prize because I'm buying more from you uh, in that way. Or the retailer have also gone a little bit on the forefront and offering a uh, reduction in price uh, if you don't select the rush delivery or telling you, um, hey, let's consolidate on the next Friday or next Saturday all your shopping. So they have been kind of proactive in that, in that way. One of the things that, that is still a question is, in some of the strategies that retailers have done, let's say offering you a coupon uh, if you don't select the, the, the rush delivery. We, we don't exactly know if that's generating additional travel because now you want to use that coupon to, to buy more and then basically the, the reduction washes off. Um, some other uh, retailers have tried to offer the in-store pickup as a way to kind of counterbalance their, some of the limitations. But what we have seen in the last couple of months uh, from some of these retailers is that they don't know if that is actually sustainable for them in the, at the economic bottom line. Uh, they said that they have used some of these strategies uh, during COVID because that was the only way to get more sales, but it comes at a huge expense to the, their operation having people bring the stuff out. So some of those things that, that can reduce the, that expectation or can mitigate the impact of the associated deliveries, we don't know if they actually uh, are sustainable from any of the dimension, either the social, economic, or, or the environmental one. That's great, thank you. A question from John Coleman, I think this might be Jesse Coleman. Uh, this is fascinating work. If, if it's not improper, may I ask who funded the research? research? Reason for asking is to learn who is interested enough to want to use the results they should be celebrated? Okay, <laughs> good question. So actually, uh, some of this work have been funded by different type of agencies. Uh, we have uh, DOT, Department of Transportation, interested in basically how much travel is associated to e-commerce. So they have that point of view. Some of this work was also funded by um, investment companies that only invest on sustainable companies. So they wanted to see if a company was sustainable or not in, in their operations. So we get the, the investment and private sector looking into that. And we also had other agencies that were looking more in terms of the emissions and energy impacts. So we get different type of stakeholders interested in different aspects of the work. So that's good because we can get more people interested. Excellent, thanks. And we're just about on the hour, but we have another question from Sandra Rothbard. Uh, Miguel, great presentation. Do you have any insights or are you working with anyone on how transportation and packaging has sustainability impacts? Less packaging is not only better for the environment, but you can fit more goods on a truck, etc. If I order online, it will come with a lot more packaging than if I go to a store and use a reusable bag. And the goods arrived at the store in larger pallets with less packaging. 
Can you comment on that? Yes, yeah, so packaging has also been one of those things that I've received increased attention uh, from the media uh, and a little bit from, from the research. Uh, and it's hard to tell. Uh, there is some research that says that packaging, we need to work on packaging to reduce some of the, the footprint. Uh, some of that research have also found that that is kind of small compared to the other contributors to the emissions and the energy. Uh, last year, or now 2019, if we count 2020 existed or not, uh, there were some companies that were trying to start looking into reusable packaging and reusable ways of, of eliminating some of these um, excess. To tell you the truth, uh, I think we need to go, uh, for some of those type of initiatives, we need to look if picking up those empty containers, picking up those, the work that it takes to clean and repurpose those, if you actually get a net benefit or you're just generating more. I know that the large companies uh, that have been at the center of the attention from the media have uh, improved and, and created their own uh, processes to mitigate the impact of packaging. Uh, the packaging is inevitable if you are receiving uh, stuff um, in your house or any other location. So yes, compared to the amount of packaging that a product is or the amount of package used for a product that gets in a store compared to a house, it's much larger. But the actual impact, uh, we, don't, we don't fully know. Wonderful, thank you. I know that there's a, at least one other question, but uh, I also see that we're after the hour. So I'm gonna take this time now to thank you very much, Miguel, for a great presentation today. Really interesting topic, something we've all become very familiar with, and to be sure. I um, uh, really appreciate your time today and also thank you to everybody who has attended this session. Um, uh, Miguel, I'm, I imagine you've got other uh, um, things to take on, but if, if you're available, uh, there might be another question or two for people who stick on the line afterwards. Okay, so again, I can a few minutes. Uh, much appreciated. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, and thank you for coming again.